with everyone. All good. Electra, would you like to <laughs> would you like to begin? I've seen yeah. your presentations on uh, YouTube, and I know your slides are usually fantastic. So I'm really looking oh, forward <laughs> to seeing uh, what your presentation today. Thank you, Brendan, and nice to see everyone. Um, I'm Electra Lupi. I am Greek, but I've been based for many years around the world, and the last few in the Netherlands who has become also a bit of a home of all this new economic thinking um, that I have also adopted in, in practice. Um, let me check if I, I, I can share my screen, great. Um, you should be able to. Yes, I can start. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to speak for half an hour. It might be a bit earlier, uh, less, sorry. And um, I would be happy also to to have uh, a small dialogue if there are any questions from the things I will be sharing. Sure. Let me have it loaded. So, yes, this is going to be a presentation about the work I've been doing in the last years um, on new economic thinking and models like the circular economy and donut economics, uh, new models that live within the wider theme of sustainability uh, and regenerative economy. And um, we, I have been working a lot with cities and city governments and city ecosystems and applying this kind of thinking into practice. And how does it, does it translate to, to participatory design, to policy making and to pilot projects in different sectors? Yes, I lead the program of Thrive, which combines all these different elements that I just mentioned. Um, a few words about the organization I'm part of. Circle Economy is an organization that started from Amsterdam. We are based in Amsterdam, about 70 people from around the world. It's very international. And um, we are active in supporting um, governments, uh, both national and local, and businesses. Uh, to implement uh, the circular economy on the ground. We work very much with practitioners and stakeholders and um, very much uh, we are a think and do tank because we provide both the, the thought leadership and, and the concepts and the ideas of this new thinking, but also the practical implementation uh, processes, tools and um, all the elements that need to come together. Sorry, just but um, maybe it's nice to start by explaining a little bit what is the circular economy for those you have never heard of the term. And it's always easier to explain what is a circular economy by understanding the current linear economy. And uh, why we say we live in a linear world right, right now and the way we have designed all man-made systems is because we follow a pretty standard way of relating with resources. So we typically take resources from extract materials and take resources from our environment or from, from nature, a better term. We take resources from nature and we use them to process and make different types of products um, that we actually use often in a very, for a very brief period of time. And at the end of their life, these products uh, uh, become waste. That's the way we have designed our main production consumption system, the main way we relate with uh, the natural world and the main way we, uh, satisfy, or we, we cover our needs. Um, we know the impacts of this. I'm not going to get into the, the narrative of the urgency of change right now. I'm going to just show how we are thinking that change could be possible. So um, again, as I said, a, a simple model that shows the different stages of a production of an economy where you, you just extract, refine, produce, sell. The use period is, is often can be 
maximum between two and three years, and most of them of the products end up in the incineration or landfill in most cases. Now, on a circular model, which is actually mimicking the basic principle of nature, where when something dies, becomes food for something else, so it goes back to the circle of life, as we say. What are we trying to do? We are trying to mimic this idea and try to create um, these circular loops and provide opportunities for the resources to stay in use as much as possible. Um, many people still associate circular economy uh, with the recycling, which is the lowest of the um, value uh, opportunities that we can create for resources. Because the, the products are have more value once they are um, in their final in, in, a, in a way we can uh, we can use them. So we can create opportunities for the products to be maintained, reused, they go back to the main retailers and they resell them with small repairing. They can go back to the manufacturing and they can be refurbished. Like a, like a washing machine and, and go get back to, to the second round of life. And the very last, last element is when we break down a product and we create, uh, we, we, create uh, we find it's very fine properties and materials. And that's when we recite. Just a basic idea. We have been working with applying this uh, and in different sectors, in different cities. It, can, it, it takes a lot of dimensions from theory to practice. But today I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about the story of um, the city of Amsterdam and, and how this, this city has been working both with a vision of becoming, oh, that's funny. There's a bird that just, no, oh, this is a nice uh, message. There was a whole bird that came in my, in my room right now up from the window. So it was a visitor. Um, I was saying that um, I would be talking more about the city of Amsterdam as an example case of the cities I've worked with. That is, it's, since it's a city that has been quite pioneering both in setting targets on, um, on becoming what, what they call a fully circular city by 2050, but also because they have been working with this um, donut economic model that I'm going to be talking to you about, which is taking it even further to the to this dimension. Um, so indeed, Amsterdam has been working and have, we have been working with the city from its early stages when they set up around in 2015, a quite ambitious vision about becoming fully circular by 2050. Back then, the, the few people also would understand this concept of what it means. And it's obviously quite um, quite an optimal state. It's not something we can achieve, but they, they started with this vision to start to identify where they need to focus to, to start like finding these different closed loops. And um, they created, let's say, like very lightly, you see some of their early draft sketches of a vision of how, for instance, the full uh, construction chain in the region could become circular. What type of, uh, of nodes and, and material repurposing loops could, could, could be there and how could you somehow circulate as much as possible the different flows of different materials and stocks? That's a way of, 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 of starting with this idea. And since then, the city has moved a lot and has applied different, um, different uh, pilot projects in different sectors, like in the food system, in construction system, but also all the consumer goods, where they started to understand that they wanted to take a much more holistic approach in the way they redesign the city so that it's not only about materials as this kind of transformations they also require a lot of uh, social change a lot of um, collaboration but also a totally different mindset with this in mind it was in 2018 when we brought 
to the city the donut economic model that you see on the right side um, to create more of a, of a holistic approach that would combine both the ecological priorities as is the intelligent management of resources together with a strong social equitable vision. And let me tell you a few words about the donut. I'm not sure, has anyone heard of this? Um, I mean, except from Jay that I know. Other people, I, I'm just looking at you. Have you heard of that of the model before? Anyone? Uh, just so to know. Okay, good. So um, this is um, a model developed by Kate Rayworth. She's a British uh, economist, with, and she wrote the book uh, Donut Economics in 2017. And the visual, I mean, it, it's actually more, more than a model, is this beautiful visual that is um, putting together humanity's 21st century goal. It's, um, it created a lot of, um, I think, um, buzz and interest because somehow it managed to merge in one image the different uh, tensions and, and, and current crisis and challenges that we are facing both on a social and ecological level. So if you see the model, it has two, um, two rings to, that form the shape of the donut. So the inner ring, what is called the social foundation, um, it is drawn from the, sustainable, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And it's and according to the model, and nobody should fall short. Everyone should, everyone in the world should have, should should have enough of these basic needs as it is accessibility to energy, clean water, food, health and education, to peace and justice. Whoever falls in, inside of the ring, it means that they don't meet their basic needs. And, and so we would want everyone to be from the ring and above and, and have more of these basic essentials and have a decent life. However, as we move away from the center to the outer circle, we see that there is another ring, which is what we call the ecological ceiling. This ring represents um, planetary boundaries. These are uh, these nine indicators. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Eight. Nine, yes, nine indicators that uh, science ha the scientists have developed um, to measure the Earth's carrying capacity. What does it mean? That once we start moving above those tipping points, those, those, those thresholds, that, uh, those indica indicator thresholds, um, uh, the Earth doesn't have the carrying capacity to regenerate itself. So there are indices that show how much we are consuming the, the Earth's uh, capacity to, to, to carry us and regenerate itself. So the more we, we meet um, our needs, we fulfill, let's say, our needs and, and we create, we use products and services, the more uh, we are using resources and, and we are uh, creating different impacts on, on, on the planet, like withdrawing water, converting land, losing biodiversity, increasing the temperature, which means that we are, um, at the moment, we are overshooting many of those. We are moving uh, beyond Earth's uh, limits. So according to the model, we are looking to be in to find this sweet spot. How can we create a system where we can meet the needs of all, so everyone can be above this ring, but we don't um, overshoot um, the limits of our planet, so that we can uh, create an an economy which is within the safe and just space, as we say, for humanity. And it's a model for a regenerative, but also distributive economy. So with this in mind, 
It's good to see this picture, which I think it has also been updated. You're seeing the, the red wedges represent the current state uh, of humanity and our planetary home. We are actually doing, uh, this is an average, right, uh, for the globe. So we are actually doing pretty bad in, in all of the social foundation. Uh, there are still uh, big amounts of population of, of people that are not having the standard of life, decent standards of life and not having their basic needs met. And still, we are um, shooting above the Earth's um, limits in many different dimensions. And as you know, there is uh, this, this one's, uh, there is a domino effect. So once there is um, um, some of those tipping points move away, there will be a very fast um, trickle down to the rest. So that's what the model actually brings. It brings together in one picture uh, the social and ecological conversation and crisis that we have at the, this moment and says, wow, this is all about an economic system that drives them both. And, and what I find interesting about it is that until this was there, those two uh, groups of people, those two narratives were often separated. You wouldn't see that um, this is, well, these are the two sides of the same coin. So that was um, what this, this model brought as a, as a novelty and as a new perception. Now, when, when we started working with this, with this model from a nice conceptual model that I just describe. okay, cool, we want to live in this donut-shaped space that is the safe and just space for humanity. We need everyone to have enough, but we don't want to overshoot more than what we have, which is one planet. What does it mean in practice? It's not that simple. Uh, we started uh, translating together with Kate Rayworth. We started working to see how does this translate on a city level? How can this concept could become a tool for the for cities to use um, to navigate and, and, and create a holistic uh, vision and a future they want to live in. So from this donut shape, we're moving to this, we are opening, we unroll this and we come to this four lenses, as we say, that represent both the here, here where we are in the city and the world, but we can also see that social foundation is still there and the ecological ceiling. And we are coming to these four lenses too to start working with a city when we want to create new strategies or a vision and playing with the different interdependencies. Let me show how it works. So when cities start to unroll the donut, this is the fundamental question here on the yellow on the left that we uh, designed to ask for a city to start playing with this concept. How can our city become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while though respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? If you if you're being a bit creative, you already see that there are four dimensions in this question. And these are the four lenses that were uh, translated from the concept of the donut to the city level. Let's start with the social local, as we say. How can all the people of our city thrive? This is, oh, let me, I, I thought it was. And then how can, I will go around all and then I will take one by one. How can our city be as generous as the wildland next door? So these are the four questions we are asking. And then if we go to the global, how can our city respect the health of the whole planet? And how can our city, our city respect the well-being of all people? More into detail, how does this translate? If we zoom in in every lens, we are 
starting to dig to get uh, and this is a tool that i'll show you how it's been used we work with in with different groups in the city to start uh, designing themselves and answering these questions so because every city is different it has different geography different history different culture and what means thrive here in Athens is very different what, than what means thriving people in Osaka. People have different values. So the starting point of, of this lens is to understand what does thriving mean to people here? How can, for instance, how can every family have a distant home? starting to bring different elements by using all the dimensions that uh, derive from the sustainable development goals, but also thinking about those that are not often heard, the, the groups that are um, less, um, that have less access. How can we create this thriving uh, play, thriving city, thriving people, and making sure that everyone is included? So this is a lens on the local social. Now, if we take the, if we look at the ecological ceiling and the lens of here for the city, here there is a biomimicry approach. Um, biomimicry is is a, is a practice of uh, taking uh, the property of of getting inspiration from the ways nature works and it, the properties and the functionalities and the services and all the all the different um, um, ways that nature employs to to provide water to regenerate to provide energy uh, to regulate the temperature we're getting inspiration from that and we are bringing it that in in the city so this this lens has been designed with this in mind how can a city be as generous as the wildland next door? What if we look at the wildland that, that is next to our city? How does it operate? And how could we mimic these uh, natural habitat properties in the way we design our city? So how can we store more carbon in our built environment, harvest solar energy? How can we better manage water and build more soil? How can we welcome more wildlife? Now, these are all these two lenses are looking at the city here, the locality, the area, respecting the natural habitat properties and the local values and historical context. But every city is part of the bigger uh, system of the planet. And nowadays, with the way we work and we consume resources and um, sorry and products most of them are being uh, produced and transported from elsewhere very rarely we like the, the amount of, of, of services and products that we use in our city are most most often produced especially in in let's talk about them the European global north potentially big cities mega, mega cities um, that have strong economies we don't see having the production lines of products also there so um, through the production of products and resources and consumption we do in the city we are impacting the whole planet how can we incorporate that in the city so how can we build and um, and produce and locally to reduce our global impact how can uh, we uh, start uh, using and reusing materials like we talk in uh, the circular economy so that we can um, we will need less virgin materials how can we reduce how much we build and and by retrofitting so that we can reduce our our, our larger impact on the land conversion biodiversity loss climate change etc and now going to the last lens, which is the global social lens, through again these global value chains, the, the things we buy here, the things we consume in this place, in this city, in Amsterdam, are having an indirect big impact on livelihoods and lives of people that have been involved in the production of products. 
how can we take that into account when we are having a conversation here in the city, how we are designing this city to be respecting the well-being of all people. So here you see again, it takes the angle of the theme of construction, but for example, how can we work in the city so that uh, the construction elements we use um, are being produced in an ethical way? What kind of materials are being included and what are the processes uh, of, for the people involved? Where are they coming from? Do we know? Can we incorporate that in our design? And what happens to the construction waste we produce? Are we sending it somewhere else again, far away, and we dump it? So all this consciousness and understanding and this four lenses perspective, how can it come forward to create um, cities and neighborhoods and policies and buildings and systems that are taking those four dimensions into account? So. And then, and then we are looking at how there are interdependencies and synergies. Now, let me check. Um, start. Is it is it is it half hour already? Uh, just about. We started at five minutes late, so if you Should want. Should I make um, yeah. five yeah. more minutes? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So. Let me show you briefly how it was with uh, the case of Amsterdam and then um, working from the beginning because of the holistic nature of the donut and um, and bringing together different uh, social and ecological topics. We had to start working directly with very many different departments in order to design this new circular economy holistic strategy. We had to bring people from both education and food and real estate, really starting to map their current priorities and their city targets on the donut. And start to imagine how can we design strategies that integrating both those positive impacts on health, education, climate, but also even taking into account gender equality and air pollution, how can we create this balancing out effect and understanding of the local and global impacts? And as the process was moving, we worked even with a larger group of change makers in the city. And here you see um, um, a gathering of about 200 practitioners in the different sectors, working together with the policymakers to somehow to inform and validate the different directions of the city, but also see from their side and from their organization how they can contribute towards this vision of Amsterdam to become a circular city living within the donut. And the output, the outcome is the, is the strategy, uh, the circular strategy of 2020, 2025, that has three areas of focus, the food and biomass, the consumer goods and construction. These priorities areas were selected because of their impact on um, economy and but also on materials and ecological impact and their potential for change. And just a few examples of, of strategies that were designed, for instance, in the food and biomass, promoting short food chains, so how the city can create a shorter uh, uh, food chains, bring the food closer to the city, uh, start creating a, a more immediate link between producers and consumer, create, a, a, create planning and areas for urban agriculture, but also close the loop of nutrients from the agriculture back to to. to to from the soil back to to materials and so forth on the consumer goods which is all the products that go that we use uh, like clothes and furniture um, there were different directions happening there one of the most interesting for me um, is strategies that uh, the city approved and decided to go for is the one that is addressing the overconsumption and decided as a municipality to reduce their um, 
consumption by 30% in um, by 2030. And uh, so they're using all their procurement power to, to redirect to new circular um, products or to leasing schemes or repairing or reusing. So really cutting their uh, consumption uh, by a, a good percentage to create a different, uh, to create a, an example, but also to create movement in the market. And uh, in the construction, there has been a lot going on about repurposing old buildings and um, always finding ways to first uh, reuse instead of demolish. But there have been a whole um, a lot of uh, a lot of directions under creating circular and socially responsible criteria for reusing a second for using secondary materials in new construction and retrofit so that all new tenders, which is the process that you need to do to, to build and um, integrates um, a certain percentage of secondary material, which is quite, quite big for policy. Now, I have a few more examples, but I think the time has stopped. So tell me how we're doing and I can also do a pause. Shall we open up for any questions for a couple of minutes? Is that okay? Uh, I think we we want to get um, Jay's presentation as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, so let uh, me just, let me just take one minute to close okay. it then, and and, uh, and we can move to the discussion. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. So just a few words to close. There have been different examples of projects of how all this thinking is slowly manifesting to initiatives uh, in the city of Amsterdam um, and many other cities that they are picking it up. And uh, Amsterdam has been a bit more advanced because we see what is interesting is that the top down, the city, the city strategy is meeting also the bottom map um, which is uh, the coalition of different actors and network of change makers that they are also picking the donut as a tool to design different initiatives from a neighborhood level to businesses and different interactions. For me, I I I, I am very I'm very fun of of this new narrative now also applying it into um, into fashion systems in London and Leeds seeing how this concept of a circular system that is also looking at both the social and the ecological angles uh, can, um, can, can play a role in creating such a systemic change, but also here working also soon uh, with three uh, cities in UK to really look uh, what is what does it mean to apply this thinking also when we are designing uh, roads and infrastructure. So yes, um, for me, what stays is the shift of narrative that this that this model and uh, that creates moving away from a traditional thinking of associating progress and success with endless economic growth to really finding finding and prioritizing what makes both people and planet thrive and what economic models can we create that they will allow that. Thank you very much for listening and uh, I'm happy to hear questions and looking forward to hearing James' presentation. Thank you so much, Electra, that was fantastic. Uh, does any, any student have a comment or question before we move to Jay's presentation? Okay, uh, Takumi-san. Thank you. Thank you for interesting, interesting presentation. And I am very interested in because uh, I'm living in Japan and Japan and Netherlands, Netherlands uh, has have both both have uh, small, small ground and uh, high density of people. So mm. uh, in Japan, uh, it is happening that uh, 
pollution from uh, big cities, Tokyo and Osaka, to uh, other countryside. Uh, so, uh, like uh, NIMBY. Uh, so, for forcing, uh, forcing them in countryside to uh, keep in touch with uh, NIMBY, like uh like uh very very dirty uh air pollution from uh burn burning uh but but uh, burning dust site uh so uh what what is happening in uh Netherlands Netherland, uh not uh to uh to uh, deal with uh, such pollution in Amsterdam and uh, such uh, such big cities, uh, how how uh, how to uh, how to keep distant from. Uh, such pollution uh in to uh for for millions of people uh la la like Japan uh uh do do you do you understand my uh pro English in uh, but this is my uh comments. Mm. I understand what you're saying, that there are some similarities about the way the cities are designed in terms of density and how to deal with um, pollution in such dense and, and small areas. But there's also, that's what I gather, and, and, um, and the opportunity that this can create in terms of, I am saying that. So there is the, the challenge of being many people in a small area and lack of land, but there is also the opportunity that resources can be looped and can we can create more of this kind of circular systems in, in some dense areas more easily uh, because there are more resources to circulate and reuse. I'm not sure if that if this covers a little bit your, your question. If you want, you can write to me and I can take it uh, later a little bit more into conversation. Uh, that's very fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I think, I think the donut economy idea is just beginning to catch on in Japan. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I was giving a workshop to Tokyo some years ago. Okay. On the, yeah. on the donut. And uh, they had a similar idea um, for, for the last 20 years, which they called the uh, uh, Junkan Gata Shaka. Yes, yes. Is, yeah, right. so, uh, uh, Takumi-san knows about it. It's basically... Uh, circulatory type um, society, but it's focusing primarily on industries. And it was something yeah. that the, the Ministry of Environment was promoting. But what you're doing is a much more um, a holistic approach. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they were just looking in the Japanese context of what waste comes out of what factory and who yeah. will be able to use yeah. that waste at yeah. another factory. I've but, heard uh, that there, there has been more um discussion on about what you're saying is the industrial symbiosis and how they can what like what industrial parks could mm -hmm. be designed also in China similar discussion mm -hmm. that they can allow for this but yeah okay oh, I, I understand I understood yeah thank you okay so it's some of the terminology of industrial symbiosis and yeah I'm just issue. I'm just sharing it in case that this serves you but yeah that's how you would call this more vision of um, on an industry level it's different terminologies that they have been used right. um, to describe um, they are all in the same family I would say absolutely they're not and they are slowly developing and, and, and evolving. And we are also evolving with them to understand more this uh, complex system Absolutely. that we are part of. Great. I don't know if anyone else has a quick question or comment. Oh, uh, Enz, 
Christian, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, question. Um, huh? Okay, go on, go on, Christian. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how much uh, resistance is there? Like, uh, usually, when people try to change anything, there's usually some resistance. Or, I like you're always talking about change makers, but is it supported by the local government and like uh, or other resistances? Or yeah. Mm. Yeah, this is a this is a big question. I'm wondering from which side uh, of all the because there is a resistance in all levels of uh, of a system when changing is happening. And I'm, I'm, I know I described the quite a the positive side of the story for the city of Amsterdam, which is also um, an evolution of many years. The, 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 they didn't wake up one day and they were all wanting the donut. And still now, not everybody within the local government understands the value of the donut, even if they have put it there and there are a lot of, um, obviously, like everywhere, a lot of different polar polarities in terms of like how, how people are politically also positioned for, for this kind of um, work. Um, what I described was a little bit also a bit of this coincidence and uniqueness that um, we see um, nicely happening in Amsterdam where there was a momentum coming from the city and at the same time a movement was happening on the ground and i think the one fostered the other to just uh, come together and become bigger there is no where in the world where you you start creating new ideas and there is no resistance and all this uh, um all these strategies or all these um, innovation projects start maybe from a smaller team in different uh, in different contexts and then they start becoming bigger they don't start with everyone approving them usually um, but uh, circular economy is becoming more of them um, of um, let's say of a standard now in Europe in Europe and um, there, there, are, there is an EU mandate that suggests that all, all countries need to implement such strategies. So nowadays there is also the must do. Donut is, is, a, very, is a very niche and um, many people adore it and, and many others think uh, that it's, um, yeah, it, it's against uh, their basic uh, financial, uh, you say priorities where you are talking about the endless economic growth of it yeah it's, Does it answer? it's really really interesting and um i love i love the way you framed it and the the also the language that you're using to describe this new narrative i think it's very powerful and i have questions but i think maybe we can uh, uh take jay's presentation uh, now and then after that open up to uh, discussion and we can hear what Alexandra's question was as well at that time so um, thank you so much Electro. Really you're welcome awesome. thank you for listening looking um, forward to listening to Jay let's see because Jay this is a different um, totally different context isn't it that you're involved in are you still muted there Jay You'd think by now, after years on Zoom, we'd learn about the the mute button. Well, um, yes, a, a different a different context. I'll try to um, add some things that are interesting. It's it's really hard to follow you, Electra, because you're so brilliant and it's such a great story. You touched on a lot of things that I think I would uh, I would I'll also point to, um, but let me just get started. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> um, and I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, I'm Jay. <laughs> and I am teaching at Schumacher College. I've been doing that for a few years. Um, I'm from California originally. I've been living uh, in Devon for 12 years. I'm from San Francisco lived in that city for a long time and, and around there. Um, 
was a part of the Silicon Valley story in a minor way, but I grew up there and, and kind of studied what happened. So I bring a lot of that sort of context into the work that I've been doing. Um, for the last 12 years that I've been here, I've been part of the transition town movement. I know there's a transition movement in, in uh, Japan. Um, I helped to start up something within the transition movement called Reconomy, which is nowhere near as sexy and successful as the donut. <laughs> We have a slightly different um, uh, approach, but uh, I've been part of that. We still are doing it here in, in Totnes um, with good results. And I'm part of a small international network of people who were involved in, in Reconomy. Um, I started up something in a nearby city called Local Spark. This is a place where there's a lot of deprivation uh, and wealth. It's, there, it's full of uh, contradictions, inequalities. And, and some really big social problems. The, the council there has adopted the community wealth building agenda. And I think maybe you have talked about it or you're about to talk about that in a future lecture. Um, and I've, I've had an opportunity these last number of years to, um, to, to visit and learn from other uh, sort of bottom-up initiatives in different cultural contexts in different countries. And I've um, I've kind of nurtured that uh, that learning uh, these last twelve years, and and uh, you know that coupled with my interest in entrepreneurship and and economics has led me to to doing what I'm doing now with Schumacher, among other things. I was also part of the Devon Donut Collective, and I'll tell you the story of that in a in a second. Um, uh, for all of this kind of work, I I I bring some some big questions along, and these are some that that I've been thinking about for a long time. How does change happen? Um, I think I think it's worth considering if you're interested in doing something that you know uh, to make the world a better place or to be a part of this the work that needs to be done this century, then you're you've got to be interested in change and and uh, this is something that we consider in our course uh, throughout. Recently, um, well, our, our last module just ended uh, a few months ago. Um, we began it with really a, a kind of a deep consideration of it. So does change happen through narratives? Do people first think about things and then manifest them? Or is it more complicated? Do things... Do things uh, in the world contribute to where people get their ideas and how people form their ideas. So, you know, we we tried to go deep with Hegel and Marx and uh and brought in some Wittgenstein to try to to try to um create a bit of a, a dialectical synthesis. And the conclusion we came to is that making change with people is super messy and complicated. <laughs> it takes lots of conversations and and usually this is kind of where I begin telling a story of how change happens that it, you know, is from the bottom up anyway, and maybe everywhere. It, it happens through conversations. That's sort of, those are the, the conversations I think are sort of, you know, the, uh, the atomic ingredients uh, of change. Um, how can citizens and, and communities take meaningful action? This is an important one, I think, because it, it, um, it brings up questions of agency and power. Power, you know, is is a part of all of this. Uh, who has the power? Um, who's making the decisions? How are people included or or not included? And and anyway, what are some of the capabilities that people have even to participate? So, um, you know, just for for further reference, some of the the thinkers that you all might be interested in checking out would be um, there would be many, but I would point to Martha Nussbaum and Marty Sen. Um, Manfred Max Neef. And I think um, some of their thinking helps to give an idea of, uh, of, of, you know, what the answers to some of those questions might be, agency, power, uh, and so on. Um, and there are many, there are so many theories and, and so many approaches to making change. And I think, I think you probably gathered um, from what Electro was saying that, um, that really the, the project requires, yes, for sure, a holistic uh, approach. And that also implies pluralism and transdisciplinarity and, 
and pragmatism, you know, in the end. So what works? What works and how can you make it work for um, your communities? And then I think the, the last one, which is an important one uh, for me, is how can you mobilize people to do anything? <laughs> That's really hard. It's hard to get people to act. And there are many, there are many reasons why people may or may not um, be able to step into their full citizenship, let's say. Um, I would point point to um, Nussbaum and Sen again uh, on that question. But more than that, I think wherever wherever you are in a society, there are people who know how to do things. There are people who have know-how, and there are people who have resources, people who have privilege. How do you begin to bring people together in productive ways so that they can uh, they can use their know-how, they can use their their capital, social capital, financial capital, whatever, uh, in this in this big project of the century? And um, one word, which is my favorite word these days, is conviviality, and. Um, it's a word that shows up in the degrowth literature, but it's it's um, I think it has come into into that literature uh, from Ivan Illich and um, and a host of other thinkers. And um, the significance of that, I think, has to do with how we reconfigure our societies. Um, you know, we have these wicked crises. The IPCC reports say, uh, in effect, that we have to totally transform our societies and our economic system. That's the project of this century. And how, so how do we reduce dramatically our emissions and our, our consumption of, of energy and the material that, um, you know, that, that from which our stuff is made? <laughs> we can circularize it to a degree. But but really, we have to consume much less. And, and this word conviviality, I think, holds a lot of promise for understanding how we can go about meeting our needs um, differently. So, um, you know, uh, for me, this, this is a good entree into thinking about the donut, at least, you know, in terms of how it's kind of shown up here in, in Devon. And I think the importance of facilitation and facilitating the, the, these kinds of convivial relationships, and I think one of the big the big benefits of the donut is is uh, its attractive power, its power to convene. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little story about the Devon Donut, and um, yeah, I was wondering if I should pop over to the website. I'm going to pop over to the Devon Donut website um, at some point because this donut diagram that that um, was produced um, is interactive. And it's kind of interesting. I think it reflects trying to trying to make the concepts in the donut relevant for this place, um, Devon. Um, I heard I've heard this saying, I don't know who coined it, that authors own their books until they until they're published and read, and then the readers own those books. So this is no longer Kate Rayworth's thing. Um, and I think that was the attitude that the people in Devon, uh, in the Devon Donut Collective uh, tried to bring to it. But um, the story kind of begins with conversations in a way, again. Um, it could go back to when Kate Rayworth came to Schumacher College. And, and maybe it goes back to when Electra and I met in Totnes 10 years ago. But uh, it was 2020 and uh, we were in lockdown because of the pandemic. And um, myself and some of my colleagues here in Devon, we had a little bit of funding to produce an event and we decided to do something that we called the Regenerate Devon Summit. It was all online. We had about 630 people uh, register and and participate, which is unheard of. Um, that was kind of built on earlier work that we had done uh, in trying to organize around here. But um, I met Kate Rayworth through our course, and I said, "Well, why don't we invite Kate to come and do something for for this online conference?" 
she sort of agreed, but she connected us with uh, Rob, who is one of her uh, her colleagues in the Donut Economics Action Lab. He ran a little uh, kind of online open space event. We had about 100, 100 people uh, participate. And, um, and then it was over, and I started having conversations with my partner, Jane, who is one of the co-directors of uh, the Bioregional Learning Center. And I said, you know, this is my version of the story, by the way. <laughs> I said, you know, you guys should maybe really think about trying to to do the donut here in Devon because it really matches with what you're what you're already doing. And um, uh, while they were thinking about it, I invited Electra to come and give a little talk about the the story of what was happening in Amsterdam. So this was, I guess, this was three years ago now, almost exactly, and that was very inspiring. Uh, we had again a huge turnout for this online talk. And that's really what sort of kicked off the, the Devon Donut. So um, uh, I'm going to explain a little bit how we do it, and then I'll go back to this, this uh, nifty diagram and, and kind of what ensued. Um, so the Bioregional Learning Center, their frame is bioregionalism. So this is another holistic way to look at, at many of the same issues that um, uh, that the donut might look at or the circular economy like uh, might look at and and sort of many other um, approaches to to trying to answer the question how can we live sustainably in a place and so um their work is holistic their work is is uh, systems oriented it's really rooted here in devon and this is a map of south devon so actually devon it, the county of Devon is, is about um, twice as large, but this is where most of the people live. Um, Totnes, where I'm from, is, let's see if I can find my little uh, spotlight. Totnes is right, let's see, spotlight, spotlight is, so Totnes is right here. Um, the two big cities are uh, like up here and over here. Um, we have a, a really um, kind of uh, diverse place. We have some urban environment. We have some rural environment. We have some kind of desolate park area. We have farmland. We have um, we have sort of all manner of things. Plus, we have fishing and, and a coast. So kind of um, diverse and interesting and complicated um, as a result. Let's see. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, so the so the approach sort of took as a you know as a, a starting assumption that that um, this was all part of a shared vision for place based regeneration. So um, this helped to recruit people into the process who also were interested in place based change, place based regeneration. Um, not everybody uses this word regeneration. Um, and they began by asking open uh, questions. How healthy is Devon? What do we need to measure? Uh, and so on. All of these were kind of related to the some of the categories um, that you find uh, in the donut. And I think the, the, the coolest part of this whole exercise was the exercise itself. So what you see here is just a little snippet of, um, of a platform that was used for a number of sessions over the course of a year that, that we called uh, Coffee and Donuts. And by we, I mean my partner, Jane. <laughs> um, let's see if I can just for a moment show you this. This is um, just to give you an indication of kind of how we, how we worked. So this is a platform called um, Mural, which is like Miro. And um, all of the sessions were very well facilitated um, with various uh, sized groupings of people from around Devon. Um, you can see uh, this is, these are some notes from session one and some of the tasks that the facilitators set for the various groups. There was usually some kind of a plenary session and then breakout sessions. Um, and from session to session, we tried to build 
on things that we were learning, uh, at things that we were thinking about, and maybe things that we were deciding to do next. So I'm not going to go through all the details here, but um, after a year, um, things really emerged. Here's a bit of a timeline that shows what emerged from the first session, the second session, the third session, and so on. Um, after about a year, a, a, a year that that process uh, stopped, and there were some aspirations to take it further, um, creating an online map of donut activities, creating a, a donut platform, um, doing a donut assembly. These were all some of the ideas that that emerged. And so um, this, this group of people who were coming together were, were interesting. And some of them became interested uh, because of the, the event that we, that we had done earlier, the, the Regenerate Devon Summit. Many of them came because um, they heard about it. And some of them came because they were directly recruited. But all of them were interested in donut economics because either they knew what it was or they didn't know what it was and had heard about it and thought that it was something that they should know or thought um, that it might be useful for, for the work that they might be doing on the ground wherever they were. Um, participants were coming from local government. They were coming from grassroots organizations. Some were uh, academics. And um, they invited experts in at various times to, to feed into the process. They really tried to value lived experience. So um, although there was a presumption that, that, um, that uh, this process should be tapping expert scientific knowledge, there was a real desire to tie everything back to the, the real lived experience of people on the ground. And what they tried to do in this way was uh, begin to tease out what might be a good understanding of a certain dimension, but also um, uh, what might be good indicators. So kind of easy to access indicators at a certain, a certain kind of grassroots level. And then ultimately uh, to figure out what could be done next. So um, this is maybe a good time for me to, to skip over to the website, but what you're looking at here are a couple of uh, spreadsheets that, um, uh, that detail each of the domains, what the overall indicator might be, what some measures could be, uh, could be taken, and then uh, possible pathways for action. And this is both for the citizen and the policymaker. And um, they built this really kind of nifty donut diagram to, uh, to make it easy to access um, some of this data. It's interactive. So if I roll over, um, coast and marine health. I think this was a, a dimension that they invented or or uh, developed for this place. So here's the domain, coast and marine health. The overall indicator for us, proportion of the seabed managed for ecosystem health, biodiversity, and local marine. The twin track measures, what could citizens do? Well, um, or you know what could what could be an indicator for for citizens? What are the number of Devon volunteers, for example, who are looking uh, at this? And for policymakers at the Devon County Council, the the indicator might be what's the proportion of Devon seabed designated um, HPME? And I forget what that stands for, but it's a sort of um, statutory designation of a place um, where there's no fishing allowed. Okay, so this is kind of interesting because because um, uh, we we're, we're kind of taking on board what our agency is as a small group, 
And we're kind of taking on board the things that would be important for us to maybe keep track of and things that our elected officials uh, might be keeping track of. And then what are the pathways for action as we understood them? So um, we thought, okay, well, citizens could join a community supported fishery, which didn't yet exist. Maybe that's something that we bring into being, or maybe we join, if we're in the in the right area, something called soul of discretion, discretion which is down in, in Plymouth. And so, um, yeah, so I think the logic here is, is evident. So an overall indicator, other, other indicators for, um, for kind of different levels of, of um, participants or actors and uh, lots of information so that anybody could come to the site and get a real flavor in these different of, of what could be done or what is happening in each of the various dimensions. Uh, along the way, um, the the process was very inclusive. So so always kind of checking in with the people who were showing up to these meetings. I think I think about 170 people participated in all, and um, trying to trying to find ways of mobilizing them into action uh, at the in the end. So we felt like we were. We were trying everything, <laughs> creating many ways to, to, to include people in a process, looking for many opportunities to bring this out to other groups and constituencies, and uh, to try to build some, some coherence around this approach that could lead to a big public event and, and more mobilizing and, uh, and maybe more uh, collaboration with other groups that are out there doing things uh, in a similar vein. So um, I guess I guess a couple things to draw. At the very beginning of this process, there was there was a, a real discussion about well, what actually is this thing? <laughs> the donut is a great um, it, it's a it's a fantastic graphic. It's a picture that intuitively conveys a kind of uh, understanding of economics relative to social and ecological well-being. Um, is that enough? Or is it really a series or a, a set uh, of indicators? Is it a dashboard? And I think this was a really important conversation to have because I think there are two groups of people here who engage with the donut, at least here. One was a group that wanted to measure everything. After all, you know, there's this old bit of wisdom, what gets measured gets managed. Um, maybe that's a little bit reductive. Maybe that's a little bit a relic of the industrial paradigm. Maybe there's another way to work if we're, if we're trying to work in the context of holism and complexity. Maybe the important thing isn't so much having all these indicators right, but rather beginning to take action. And from my own perspective, I think there's a lot of wasted energy in, in uh, the former, in the metrics. I'm not saying metrics aren't important, they're super important, but I think sometimes um, too much importance is placed on them. Um, the other uh, aspect here to draw out, I think, is about engagement and mobilizing and and I think an ongoing consideration when working at the at this level, at the bottom up kind of level, is what is what is real engagement? Um, what's what's the measure of that success? I think for me, the measure of that success would be mobilization. Um, my experience in the transition network and other similar groups um, is is constantly trying to engage members of the community to really kind of step into their citizen citizenship to take action to do something to work with others it's extremely hard and um what does work to bring people together is to do things that um that are fun that are entertaining 
that um, that bring joy. And why not? Um, so 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 maybe there's an aspect of the donut or that there could have been here, and I'm familiar with other sort of grassroots cases, that's really kind of about learning. And so in that regard, I think it's extremely powerful as a, as a device, as a, as, a, as, a, as a way in for people to begin thinking about economics and, and some of the, the issues that are contained within the donut. Um, I think for us with the Devon Donut, in my opinion, the best thing was the was the process, and um, I don't know if I've, I mentioned this before, but I think uh, being able to convene and facilitate processes that bring people together for productive conversations, for exchange of learning, is the most important thing for making change. Alongside some other most important things, but it's very important. So. So the skill of facilitating participatory events, the skill of, of uh, facilitating things like, like the, the process that Electra was involved with in Amsterdam and in other places, um, the process that, that we've been involved with here and in other places where they're using um, these powerful participatory tools and facilitating them well, super important. And I, I guess one, one other last point is around popularity. Um, I've been doing this kind of thing for a long time and and engaging intellectually with various approaches and, and concepts. And I've tried to put forward a few things of, of my own that that work or they don't work. And I think there's real value in being popular. There's also a danger, of course, but but at the moment there and I don't know if the moment is fading, Electra, but but there was there was a real palpable excitement about donut economics and the people were really interested. And I thought, I thought that was great. And it's something to work with that kind of energy. And, um, you know, if it works, you know, and if people are interested in doing it, then, then I'm kind of all for it. So, um, I am going to stop now. I think that leaves us with a few minutes. I probably, um, could have gone into more detail here and there, but, um, I think uh, I'm I'm ready to field some questions or, or comments if you like. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we can open up. So if any students have questions, please raise your um, digital arm. I have a I have a question actually that applies to both of you, which is um, so I kind of feel like maybe less so in the case of uh, Amsterdam, but certainly for the donut Devon donut, you're. You're more like um, a shadow organization, not the main structures. So um, the main structures, the main institutions, the ones that have all the power and the resources are just carrying on doing their regular business. And you've created forums where these discussions are taking, these conversations are taking place. And these conversations are very important and very powerful, but the issue we face is that these structures are very resilient. They are very difficult to, to change. So I'm just wondering, <laughs> what is your hope or your aspiration in terms of, you know, say between now and 2050, that somehow this flips and becomes mainstream? Or um, do, you, do you think that's naive to imagine that it would flip and become the mainstream thinking? It, um, so, for instance, in the case of Amsterdam, you talked about Amsterdam uh, 2050 being a sort of circular economy. There's got to be a roadmap to get to get to that. And it's got to be a roadmap that everybody's well, that can work its way around these institutional barriers. So have you thought about that at all in both cases? Perhaps maybe electric could start and then Jay. Yeah, it was um, just to, to understand uh, what was your, your question. How you're to saying, mainstream this, yeah. How to mainstream this. Yeah. This is a philosophical question, Jay. No, so it's to... actually not, so that it's actually business as usual, rather than, yeah. some, you know, because what's yeah. happening is you're, you're not fully uh, resourced like local government is. Um, you're not a department of the local government and so on and so forth. And so actually... You're, you know, ancillary. You're not 
critical uh, to the operation of the, those institutions. And we won't get anywhere until it becomes what we're talking about here becomes actually like mission critical. So I'm mm. just wondering, how do we do that? I mean, I will take a bit of, a, of an intro and then give it to Jay uh, <laughs> in terms of how you can ma mainstream mainstream such um, such new 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 concepts. Um, so there there are, um, there are different ways that we we try to also. I mean, it, it's a we are also working with a practice based. Um, approach so we are learning a lot from the experience because you can there is a lot of theory about how you make system change and on an academic level um, but my experience uh, says that you need to have different elements in place I would say if, if you ask me for a, a, if I had to create now a recipe in for in a playing field I would say you definitely need to have um, a group of uh, ambassadors, like champions, I call them, that they do understand the work, and that they are in different um, in different bodies, and that means having someone within the government, not one person, but people that have also, and um, they have a sphere of influence within within their their way of working. And they have also strong interest in making change happen. So you always start with this. And um, to, to make it scale, our approach is that we need to show that it's practical and that it, we need to, to work with a lot of different actors and let them pick up the work and do it. So for me, it's critical to to engage with the different levels and let them collaborate. When I say levels, I mean the government, civil society, and business community. And um, and then, yeah, there is this fine balance between um, theorizing and and and, and make measuring, as as Jay said. And Amsterdam also is is great that they use the donut. I didn't have the chance to show that in a similar way, like. In Devon, they have developed a dashboard of indicators to measure the city progress, which is good. We need that. We need the city also to shift their their their. This is actually small in a way because it's as a dashboard of indicators, but it's huge because it 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 guides the overall conversation about what matters. And at the same time, you need to have a lot of pilot projects on the ground and a lot of things to. To, to be happening and, and, and showing that this is real and they can inform policy. And uh, yeah, policy is one of the key enablers to scale it. Finance is another one. And for me, the most critical thing is how to, to put all these elements uh, together as much as possible. And that's where, where it gets difficult and interesting. Like how are they coming? Um, so with this, I give it now to Jay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, this is a, well. Uh, this is a, this can be a whole uh, weekly course. Of how can change happen, and how can yeah. we scale it? Uh, so yeah, yeah. A whole week well, course. It's a big question in in our course, and and I think there's no easy answer. Um, how do we make it mainstream? Yes, exactly. This is what we're doing. All of, all of the stuff that we're doing is about is about um, shifting the the attitudes and the worldviews and the frames uh, through which people, you know, um, locate themselves in the world. And so it happens on, on many different scales, in many different ways. And, you know, the other guys are doing the same thing. So um, in order to make this mainstream, we just have to keep doing it. It's kind of like everything, everywhere, all at once. Maybe you've seen the film. It's kind of like being the mom in that film. You just have to, you just have to just keep doing it and keep doing it. Learn what works and do the things that work. Try things out. Uh, and this is true whether you're working in policy or you're working on the ground. Um, you know, um, so so it's kind of like doing more of the same 
in in a way um but um it takes it takes i think um it takes spreading the awareness and applying the awareness and being being good change makers so i would come just because of you know where we are in this class i would say to to all of us here in this in this room this is our job now in this century is to is to be um effective at whatever level of agency we have and whatever our capabilities are to to kind of move us into a new social and economic and political paradigm in the 21st century, however we, we may be able to do it. I know it's kind of a, a trite answer, but I think it's it's the best I can do. No, it's, uh, I just thought you might know that you have the secret. <laughs> <laughs> And then yeah. in one class, we figured it all out and we can stop. <laughs> can, I, can I say something back for, to, because there, I got there's some inspiration from what Jay said. Is that okay? Sorry. Yeah. I was just thinking like on the same question of like how things can become mainstream. You know, now we are in such a, such a global world, like we are in such a, like information travels in such a speed. And, you know, you feel like change in your small sphere, you're trying to do things, but there is so much of an exchange and of inspiration that happens also throughout the world. And um, I, mean, I, I think somehow this butterfly effect, we, we are witnessing more and more how fast things can travel. And maybe in our locality, uh, what we're doing is not exactly scaling, but it can inform um, many other places. So this international kind of exchange and inspiration is also very key for this kind of things to become more mainstream. Yeah, I, I guess the reason I asked is that in this course, we've been looking at many different kinds of initiatives. We've been talking about community wealth building. We've been talking about uh, universal basic income, um, now the donut economy. And some of these like have a shelf life, if you like. They come and they go. Um, but uh, and then there is also a lot of instances where they are a very interesting pilot project, but the pol politics change and the initiative is crushed. And so, and it just seems like when things you know are start good things are starting to happen, uh, that's when some people seem to move move against it in a quite uh, uh, worrying way. And I guess what we're what we're hoping for in this course is that the bits, all these different initiatives are actually part of a big picture transformation. That's what we're hoping for. But that big picture is not necessarily something that's clearly recognized yet um, mm. and fully subscribed to. And then what we see as a consequence is that those people with great ideas who are trying to bring about change are actually forced to do it on the fringe, if you like, on the edge, uh, with not enough mm -hmm. resources. Um, and all the results, and you said it yourself, Jay, it was like, it's about power and agency and resources. And it's the ones who hold, hold the power are able to maintain the current model, the, the status quo. And that's the question is, how do we break through that is what... Uh, we're puzzling in this course and uh, we're trying to, you know, we're talking to practitioners in different projects to see how close you are to, say, for instance, breaking through in Amsterdam or in, in Devon. Jay? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to um, add a little something to, to what you're saying, because I think, I think you're right. We often talk about top down change and bottom up change but we don't often talk about the side to side change. So I think you're right. You know, when we look across the world, there are many initiatives, many, many, so many. Um, there, are, there are thousands of transition groups. Now there are a growing number of, of people on the ground adopting community wealth building as a, their frame for organizing. Um, I think today or yesterday, Rob from, uh, from Donut Economics Action Lab or DEAL, uh, was launching their community tool. Um, I know that there are people trying to organize locally uh, through the frame of degrowth and solidarity economy. 
and permanent. And there's so many. And uh, what what we often find sometimes is that those of us in one sort of brand of new economy talk past the people in another brand because, oh, well, we don't do it that way. Or, you know, our ideological starting point is different or the lens that we use is, is different. And I really saw this. We were talking earlier about um, the, the conference that I went to, Brendan, in Amsterdam. And then a couple of days later was the, the Beyond Growth Conference, two different paradigms. But I think where we can really drive change at this point is even though we don't know the name or how to describe this place that we're trying to get to, I think most of us know what it is. Right. And you know, you can find it in the donut and the SDGs and other places. We need more justice. We need to take care of the people. We need to reduce our impacts. We need to take care of the of ecosystems. I think we all can safely say we know it. We know that. So is there a way in which we can start working together? I think this is the side to side part, building more coalitions, more cross fertilizing, getting rid of our ideological assumptions. I think ideology is not our friend in, in this in this project, being pragmatic and finding the opportunities to do things. And I think if if we all understand that this system that we're in is a complex adaptive system, then we should be OK with not being able to predict what's going to lead to the, the result. We have to keep trying different things and, and then we'll be surprised when there are ripple effects um, that we can't anticipate that lead to some massive shift in in how uh, how things are going and how people are viewing the world. So I just wanted to add that part in. No, that's great. Thank you. And also I'm glad you mentioned that we should avoid ideology because I totally agree with you on that one. And that's why some of these pilots have actually failed because they've been seen as ideologically unacceptable for the next administration. Um, Electra, would you, would you like to end with uh, a comment? We're kind of at time now. I mean, yeah, I could give a comment, but I'm also very curious about how, how all, all this has resonated with people and if uh, someone else would like to, to give a voice to a final comment as well. Okay. Uh, or anything. Yeah, maybe we have we should hear from the students if they have some reflections. Anybody? Or shall it, I it doesn't need to be yeah. and we can hear. Well, I'm gonna start with Alex maybe and then see if anyone else would like to. I always pick on Alex. Oh good. Um no, yeah, I first of all thank you both very, very much. I think we all appreciated the presentations a lot. Um uh, I've already taken a course actually on the donut economy. So this is kind of a refresher. Um, but it's definitely really, definitely really fascinating. I mean, there are definitely hurdles there, but it doesn't seem like anything impossible. It's actually quite the opposite. I've actually never heard the phrasing of it being natural before. That was a, a first time hearing that phrasing of it, which makes a lot of sense, actually. It is it is actually following natural patterns, right? I, I just never put two and two together. So uh, that's definitely something I'm at least taking away. Is it it's not hard, it's natural. Nice. Great. Anyone else? Maybe Craig, do you have a comment? Are you there, Craig? He looks like he's frozen, actually. Um, or um, Chloe, do you have some reflection? Not my reflection in particular, but I also wanted to thank you both for the presentation. Um, I didn't know anything uh, except for the presentation we had about donut economy. Wow. But uh, so I learned a lot and that was really, really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. Um, Christian, do you have a comment? No? Craig? Yeah, anything? I thought you were stuck there for a minute. Can we... Am I frozen? Do you... No, you're fine. Do you have any oh, okay. reflections? Oh, I, I'm... My reflection is that the idea of, you know, when you're taking these products that have been used again, you're trying to recycle them back into the uh, economy. I know one of the biggest hurdles is when, uh, uh, when like a like a product or a thing you're recycling back is very complex with a lot of parts to it. Like let's say a computer, like recycling a computer can be very difficult. But I know nowadays we have these really cool recycling facilities that are being built that actually can recycle these complex and um, 
uh, machinery type uh, objects back into the economy. So it's very interesting how to learning about how it's like being implemented in cities functionally. So I, I enjoyed it. Great, thank you. So actually, before um, your presentations, I uh, I was reminded actually of a, a really really great book by uh, an, an architect, Asby Brown, and it's called Just Enough. And what he does, what is he looks at actually Edo Japan, and um, actually Edo Japan was a donut economy, basically for three hundred years. And um, so it's a, it might be a good case study, but there's um, it to totally recycling everything. Um, they have the jobs that would do that, uh, local food uh, supply, um, but they also um, describe it as a society of restraint, um, very enriched life, but uh, it's Edo is Tokyo in medieval period. Yeah, so when in that period the the rivers of Tokyo were completely clean, at a time when uh, European medieval uh, rivers were polluted, and so Edo actually I think the donut economy is something that resonates uh, with the Japanese people quite strongly. So I would really recommend if you get the chance to track down this wonderful book, and he explains actually that the quality of life, even though people lived in very small houses in Edo. And of course, they had a very hierarchical structure. The quality of life in Edo was very rich. People were thriving in, uh, in an economy that was very much uh, one of restraint. And some of the best traditions of Japan, such as the communal bathing, <laughs> I don't know if you can see that picture, the communal bathing, comes from the Edo uh, era. So you can see that uh, maybe we just need to, to rediscover some of these um, Past, uh, stories from the past as well. Wonderful book. Asby Brown is a fantastic person. I'll I'll send a link to a talk he gave on TED. You can check it out. But uh, maybe can, we've gone over five minutes, but I think it was really fantastic session. And I just really want to thank both of you for wonderful talks. I wish we had more time. <laughs> I really do. Um, but uh, thank you. It's been great. Thank you so much.